So, uh, hello everyone. Uh, welcome to this uh, version of the global webinar. Uh, I'll be moderating today. Uh, my name is Arthur, and we have in the panel Guy, uh, Bertil, Christian, and the speakers Elio and Sarah. Uh, it's usually, really my pleasure to moderate this. We have two incredible speakers today and great friends. Uh, and they are going to be specific, uh, speaking on the specifics of and details of some uh, extra um, hemispheric surgery techniques. Uh, let's start with uh, Elio Rubens. Uh, Elio is a professor of neurosurgery at the University of Sao Paulo and a, let's say a quite old friend, right? And uh, he's going to be speaking in the pitfalls for uh, hemispheric surgery and MEMAG. We all know that MEMAG is a challenging uh, pathology and uh, surgery may, might be challenging if you want to fully disconnect and adequately disconnect the hemisphere. So we are eager to hear from you. And please go ahead, share your screen and go ahead. Uh, today we are going to have uh, two 20 minutes uh, lectures by Elio and Sarat. And after that, we have uh, time for discussion. It's 50 minutes for discussions. I think it's enough uh, time for discussion. And I'm pretty sure that uh, uh, we're going to have a really great discussion today. So, Elio, please. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Arthur. And uh, thank you for the opportunity to share with you my experience with uh, Amy Megan Encephaly. We all know that it's very difficult to treat these cases. In fact, hemimegalencephaly uh, was described, uh, was first described 185 years ago, and uh, is a rare sporadic congenital brain malformation involving the overgrowth of a, all or part of one hemisphere. Epilepsy, uh, intractable epilepsy, uh, the onset is very early in life. Sometimes some parents know that uh, even before birth, there are typically isolated cases, but may be associated with uh, neurocutaneous syndromes as uh, neurofibromatosis, tuberous sclerosis, thermal, nervous cyst syndrome, or other cases. What uh, characterizes this, uh, this entity is the enlarged hemisphere, at least one lobe. The cortex is very thickened. There's, there are uh, broad GRI. The abnormal uh, gray matter, white matter differentiation, neuronal heterotopias, the ventricles are very asymmetric, sometimes dilated, but uh, frequently you see small ventricles, what uh, is, is, uh, is still uh, uh, a difficulty for the surgery. But we see very commonly the hypertrophy of white and gray matter, and uh, some uh, cases with hematomatous uh, uh, lobe or for instance in this case of the frontal lobe. So uh, this uh, hemisphere is enlarged, asymmetric, and uh, as I said, uh, frequently with the small ventricles, and this deformation is the problem because you, you will not find one case similar to the other one. They look all different. And this is the problem for the surgeon. And uh, sometimes this uh, hematomatous uh, brain is very tough and bleeding during, uh, during all the time during surgery. This uh, is an example of uh, one of the syndrome cases, a child, a 10 month old child with uh, epidermal nervous syndrome or proteal syndrome. You see the hemi hypertrophy, the lipoma of the face and the, uh, uh, the nervous. In this case, the ventricle is very dilated and the aspect of the brain is this. You see veins that are typically very anomalous, exactly the place where you will do your approach. It, you can do any. Uh, the other problem that we uh, typically find in these cases is contralateral abnormalities. This is quite common in the 
in the negative encephalic cases. When there is a clear asymmetry in epileptogenesis, uh, surgery is still indicated, but you uh, may guess that the results will not be the same when you have contralateral uh, uh, alterations as uh, in uh, these three uh, cases. How to treat these uh, patients? Uh, for, all, for over the years, hemispherectomy is, is still an, a good option. I don't deny that. But uh, you must remember that's a high operative risk uh, although in many centers, uh, for instance, here, the Center for Ezio-Duroco published a lot of, uh, on these uh, cases and the Cleveland Clinic experience, uh, they prefer uh, hemispherectomy in these cases. And now that hemosiderosis that was in the past was a problem, uh, we now know that this, uh, in fact, is uh, related to uh, the complications of hydrocephalus. The other problem is uh, actually is hydrocephalus. It's not fair for the surgeon to treat such a difficult uh, problem as semi-magnencephaly and provoke another uh, severe uh, uh, case that uh, hydrocephalus. We all know uh, the problem is the, with hydrocephalus. It is, in the cases of uh, hemispherectomy, uh, hemimegalencephaly is a uh, more, most frequent association with hydrocephalus. For instance, in this series, 40% of cases is too much. Uh, in general, uh, the experience uh, in uh, uh, hemispherectomy is not high in the Cleveland Clinic, but overall, as you can see in this, uh, review, it goes up to 80%. That, that is too much. We all know the problems that uh, uh, hydrocephalus can uh, cause for these uh, children. And mainly because we prefer to do surgery uh, uh, before, as early as possible, and mainly in infants. And in these uh, infants, uh, hydrocephalus is uh, really a challenge and more frequent. So uh, how... Uh, I, uh, I will show you uh, how I uh, approach these cases and uh, how I, I, I choose to, to, it was my choice uh, from the beginning, some uh, 20, 30 years ago, to uh, do uh, uh, hemispherotomy instead of hemispherectomy in this case. The technique that I choose was the, the, the lateral approach with, uh, proposed by Willem Muir, with the modification by many. And uh, this technique starts with uh, uh, the delimitation of the frontal parietal operculum. And uh, the aim of this surgery is this. This is a case of hemimegalencephaly. The aim is to preserve as much of the brain as possible in order to avoid, to try to avoid uh, this uh, common complication that is uh, uh, um, hydrocephalus. So the first thing which the, the step uh, number one, uh, we uh, del delimit the, the, the operculum, the frontal parietal operculum. Okay, but the, the problem is, where is exactly the frontal parietal operculum in this case? I will show many uh, uh, operative figures uh, in this uh, situation, as you can see, to correlate with the MR. So in this case, you see a big frontal lobe as uh, in the other case, the, this hematoma in the frontal region. So uh, it's not easy to exactly delimit the frontal parietal operculum. Where is it? Where do, are you going to approach the insula? For instance, in another case, you see this uh, lysencephalic brain. And in all cases, you see the, 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 the anomalous venous system, sometimes uh, uh, more anomalous than the other one, but uh, this is typical for every case. In this case, I have already shown the very anomalous venous system. So step number two, that will be the 
the real resection of the operculum, and uh, in order to get to the, the, the insula. Uh, as the, the cortex is deformed, be prepared to uh, find a, a very, very uh, bulky uh, operculum, very, very thick bulk uh, operculum, and it bleeds all the time. So it's not easy to, um, to uh, uh, do this kind of surgeries. And uh, uh, some uh, of the problems that we see, you see that the, the shallow, the, the insula is very shallow, it's, it's common. Again, the ventricle is small. Uh, as you can see in these two cases. So uh, uh, make attention not to go straight to the basal ganglia overpassing the, the, the insula and provoking uh, more problems. So the next step will be the insular corticectomy that we have to perform in this case. Again, problems with the hemimegalencephaly. You, be, you see that, again, the, the insula is shallow and the, 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 the cortex of the insula sometimes is very thick. So again, not easy to do that. So just after the resection of the, the, the periculum, what we typically do is to find the arteries, the branches of the, art, the medial cerebral artery and follow every branch in direction of the trifurcation. And uh, just uh, in the junction of M2, M3 uh, branches of medial cerebral artery, avoiding uh, the, 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 the small lenticular straight arteries that we uh, will not uh, uh, damage at this point. So, uh, yeah. Uh, following the, you, you, you try to delimit the, the insula, and again, it's very thick. And if you stay exactly in the plane, the tight plane, the, the external uh, capsular, ex, uh, as uh, you see here, the whitish the tissue, and just below the gray matter, we, will, we will, won't have problems of bleeding. Uh, the problem is the lenticular straight uh, uh, arteries come uh, from below here. And uh, uh, the direction of the, the, the instruments of the surgeon and bleeding in this position is uh, very difficult to stop because the arteries are perpendicular. And next step is uh, prepare for the calazotomy. So we, through the, the, the circular circles of the insula, the, you go in the, in the direction of the ventricle. But before that, you have to section the horizontal fibers and the frontal orbital uh, uh, region. Again, with more problems because the bulky uh, frontal lobe in, in many cases make the distance from the, the operculum to the midline and to the Jura's rectus very long. This is a long distance in this uh, direction. And uh, remember that this uh, hematomatous tissue is this, uh, stuff, bleeding, and sometimes it's not easy to do that. How can we uh, uh, overcome this difficulty? So this is the frontal lobe. We uh, in these cases, we uh, try to delimit a, a large portion, a generous portion, and that's the way we, we try to uh, make this uh, situation easier. We do a corticectomy larger than usual, and then we uh, have more easily, we may access to the midline that is necessary to uh, disconnect the frontal region. And then, you will find the, the ventricle and proceed to the um, calizatum. But stopping before this planium, and I'll tell you in a minute why we stop before this planium. And again, here you have problems. Problems because of this uh, bulky uh, corpus callosum. It's typical to see uh, in many children, you see this. Uh, uh, hypertrophy of the white matter. 
And sometimes this uh, hematomatous aspect are real. It's really a tumor, almost a tumor. And remember that you have from the ventricle, you have to go to the midline to find the pericalosal artery. If this, this bulky uh, portion of the corpus callosum is not uh, uh, difficult to go to the other side and provoke lesion with contralateral uh, corpus callosum. So how, how can we manage this, uh, in this situation? The way we do this, we, uh, when we approach the, the, the midline in the front or front orbital region, we uh, find the anterior cerebral artery in this portion. And then we go to the body of the corpus callosum and we find the pericalosa, the distal portion, A3, A4, of the pericalosal artery, and then we, put, we go anterior and superior following the artery. That's the only way you can uh, overcome this uh, difficulty. And you do this in, in every case. Sometimes you, say, you see what the, the, the thickness of this uh, region, what it can be uh, and in many cases. So, it's plenial, it's plenial. We, we don't come straight from, from up. Why? Because the, the pericalosal artery, the, the distal branches, say three or four or five, they are thin and uh, uh, they are infrequent. So uh, it's difficult to follow the artery. You may lose uh, the path. So stop here and after the resection of the temporal lobe, I'll tell you this in a minute, you just follow the free edge of the dentorium. So you follow the free edge of the dentorium and superiorly and then in the direction of the faults. You overpass the, the venous, the deep venous system, and just anterior to this uh, fault, uh, uh, typically you find the splenium. And you go from inside the splenium until you see the blue line. There's a blue line that show the, the limit to stop where is the, there are the, the, those uh, uh, deep veins. This is a superior view. So you see the free edge of the tentorium, the splenium, and that's uh, the way you go in this uh, case. The final step, typically in this uh, technique, you, uh, from the inferior circles of the insula, you, uh, you resect the hippocampus, amygdala, and parahippocampal gyrus. But in the last four or five years, we choose, I choose to, to uh, resect the temporal lobe in order to avoid eventual problems with the uh, intracranial hypertension related to ischemic change, as I will show in a minute for you. So in our cases, 34 cases uh, uh, that we have uh, operated on, the majority of cases uh, hemisphere often. But there's uh, one thing, why we do partial surgery if we know, already know that this doesn't work? Why uh, we do still, in some cases we did this. The, the, the reason is that uh, uh, sometimes the parents, when we talk to the parents and we tell them that, uh, uh, the, the, the child already has some hemiparesis, but sometimes they do not accept a complete deficit. And that's the decision of the parents. The other thing is uh, sometimes the epileptologists uh, uh, are sure, uh, think that the epileptogenesis is focal and is more related, for instance, for the quadrantic, posterior quadrantic region. That is not true. When we do uh, ECOG during surgery, we see that there, there are many spikes coming from uh, the frontal region. This is an hemispheric uh, disease. And in, at least in two patients, we have to stop temporarily uh, because of bleeding in small children that we uh, came after and finish uh, complete surgery. But what is interesting with this case, they are seizure free for a short period of time. And uh, for, uh, sometimes for one year and a half, for two years. And the, uh, 
in some cases we converted to hemispherotomy, but some cases the family are, are happy with the reduction of seizures and the cognitive and uh, behavioral improvement. Decided to stop, uh, not to proceed to surgery. In some cases they are waiting for definitive surgery. So, uh, redo surgery. So we, we uh, in a revision that we did some uh, up to, to uh, 2018, we had 18 redo surgery for hemispherotomies. The half of these cases were related to uh, hemimegalencephaly. And we insist to do the same thing, to reveal the, the perinsular hemispherotomy. Uh, but we use, uh, they are typically, uh, uh, there's some connection typically anterior and posterior, as I show in this case. What we do is uh, we, we uh, prove that with the DTI tractography, you see the, the, the connection as uh, I'm showing here in the two of our, our cases, anterior and posterior. And then with neural navigation, it's very uh, it's e easy to go back and just uh, uh, cut these uh, connections. Hydrocephalus, we had two cases. In this uh, child, uh, things went okay. Surgery was, was done one year after. Catheter is in good position. The ventricle is, uh, is okay and the child is very well. But sometimes you have this. The catheter is there and you have uh, a, a huge uh, uh, dislocation of the, the contralateral uh, uh, hemisphere. And we don't know uh, if this is related to poor over, late overcome or not. We will never know that. In our case is morbidity in one case, ischemia, Ischemia is quite uh, common in this case because the venous anomaly is very large. But in one case, we had a late a neurological deficit. This is the case in the, with the hemispheric uh, uh, ischemia. And uh, in spite of uh, the compression, the child uh, had a late sequela. And note that the bilateral you have uh, ischemia also probably relate to basic spasm. And one child died. Uh, again, uh, uh, this uh, venous anomaly, this child, this uh, small child, had a, a typical hemimegonocephaly, difficult case, and developed uh, a, a very severe uh, hemispheric uh, ischemia. And in spite of uh, the compressive craniectomy, he died 48 hours later. Late results, uh, it's uh, interesting that the risk, the, the very early results are very good, but the reality is this. Well, after five years, you have around the 60, 60, more 62% of uh, uh, favorable results in the, these cases. So, in conclusion, so hemimegalencephaly is really an important uh, etiology for this uh, catastrophic epilepsy in children. And surgery should be uh, performed, should be indicated as soon as possible. Uh, I prefer, although challenging, I prefer to indicate hemispherotomy in this case. And I think that the mortality and morbidity in these cases are, uh, are low, that uh, I, we can do it. And I, again, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, uh, Helio, for your review and showing us uh, how life can be difficult and how we can uh, try to avoid complications and get better results. Let's move to, to Sarat's presentation. Uh, uh, Sarat is professor of neurosurgery at the Olinja Medi Institute of Medical Science and the director of the Center of Excellence for Epilepsy there. Uh, uh, he is also part of a very exquisite uh, group of uh, couples on epilepsy because uh, his wife is uh, an epileptologist, as my wife is, and many others. We should put forward a group of epilepsy couples. Uh, and he's going to be presenting to us on endoscopic and radio frequency techniques for hemispherotomy. And I think that after Sarad's uh, presentation, we are going to be ready for an interesting discussion. So, Sarah, please go ahead. 
Thank you so much, Arthur. Am I audible clearly to you? Yes, it is. Thank you. Thank you so much, Arthur. It's indeed a great pleasure and honor for me to speak on this forum. And like you said, I would be speaking on uh, our experience of pioneering these two techniques. Endoscopic is, of course, well known now, but I would also be presenting a new technique today, which is a radio frequency technique for hemispherotomy. So no conflicts of interest. And that is the institute where I work, the All India Institute of Medical Sciences. Uh, I always like to start my hemispherotomy lectures with this slide because this patient has had so much of impact on me. Now, this was the first ever case of hemispherotomy, which we did uh, in the year April 2002, who came to us in altered sensorium, had to be intubated. He was having 200 to 300 seizures. And we did hemispherotomy almost in a semi-emergency setting. And we were so happy to see the good outcome in this patient. And he came back in 2015 as a fully grown up adult. He had a mild grip weakness, but otherwise he had recovered completely. And he could see one of the incisors missing because he had to be intubated in the emergency. Now, soon after we did this case, in about five years, we published the first ever series of hemispherotomy from India. Now, like the excellent uh, talk given earlier in the early, by the earlier speaker, Professor Meshado, it's very clear that hemispherotomy, even though is a single uh, technique, but it's applied to an heterogeneous group of pathologists which could vary from something which is as straightforward to something which is so complex as hemimegalencephaly as spoken very nicely by the earlier speaker, which I believe is one of the most difficult pathologies to either treat or operate in the brain. Now, our own uh, gro growth ladder is that in 2002 onwards, we started doing open hemispherotomies and I prefer to do both lateral as well as vertical so that we could have the option of using either one of this technique depending upon the individual pathology. And then in 2008, I shifted to interhemispheric approach, especially when we acquired the intraop MRI brain suite. And I found that you don't actually require much uh, retraction uh, and you are able to do a very nice uh, hemispheric disconnection using this technique. And then finally, in the year 2012, we started doing the endoscopic technique once we procured the ROSA and the OAM and we attached the endoscope to the ROSA and we started doing the endoscopic techniques. Now, uh, initially, when we conceptualized the technique of hemispherotomy, to me, it sounded as easy as, or as difficult as trying to pass a, a camel through the eye of the needle. But uh, we, we, we brainstormed and we started our learning curve with large craniotomies and finally we settled down to a small craniotomy of three into four centimeters, which is put, which is placed along the anterior part to avoid the bridging veins. And surprisingly, when we approach uh, from the anterior part, the footprint is very small as compared to the direct vertical approach. And it's, it's very important to have a proper uh, endoscopic ergonomics in order to tackle these pathologies. And later this became uh, the sole procedure of choice for all pathologies, including even hemimicalencephalus. Excuse me, Sarat, it's Guy. I'm sorry to interrupt. Can you unshare and reshare your screen? Apparently, some of the viewers are not seeing it. I'm seeing it fine, but some people are not. So maybe unshare and then share again. Okay. Hopefully that fixed it, because like I said, I see it fine, but let's, let's try now. Is this okay? I see fine. Arthur, you see okay? Yes, yes, we're getting it. Yes, it, it's, it's fine with me. Yeah, people are now am seeing I, it. Thank you, I apologize am I, for interrupting. Am I audible clearly? Yeah, everything is good. Video is good, audio is good. Thank you very Great. much. Thank you. So uh, I presented the uh, preliminary, preliminary results of the endoscopic technique, if you remember, in the first ESTM uh, conference held in Gothenburg in 2014. And we are here at the first ever ESTM webinar in the year 2020. And what have, been, ha, what have we been doing in, during this period? Obviously, we learned the technique well. We learned how to apply to various colleges. We also published papers uh, uh, which kind of standardized the procedure. And here I would like to acknowledge my colleague uh, Baumgartner, who uh, dis published this very nice paper on four cardinal techniques of hemispherotomy and epilepsy following the Gothenburg meeting in 2014. Now, our own learning curve started with drawing for, for atrophic pathologies where putting in an endoscope was a pleasure and it helped us to learn the anatomy very well. 
And uh, once we were comfortable, we moved on to more complex pathologies. For instance, this is a very uh, complex hemimegalencephaly, which I operated in Malaysia, uh, courtesy Dr. Vairavan. And then it allowed us to develop uh, new techniques. For instance, we described for the first time an endoscopic assisted corpus callosotomy with anterior hippocampal and posterior commissurotomy for patients with very severe relux distort syndrome. And it worked out very well for this cohort of patients. And then, of course, we proceeded uh, uh, to publish and it got accepted you know, as a standard procedure in textbooks. And this is the latest paper which we published in JNS. And then we understood the role of the temporal stem. And this is one of the papers which has been published by, by ex-fellows, uh, uh, Shabri Girishan. And he showed by very nice anatomical and cadaveric dissections that uh, it is, uh, unless we are careful, it is possible to leave a small portion of temporal stem, which is a bundle of white fibers, which is anterior to amygdala and placed at an inferior level, uh, which has not been so much described by Professor Dilaland. Uh, and this also has to be tackled. So in our series, when we did MRI for uh, eight of our patients where seizures were not controlled, uh, we were able to uh, find out that there was a residual temporal stem in about uh, four of these patients who underwent a repeat surgery. And we were able to enhance our outcomes from 80 to 90% uh, uh, tackling the temporal stem. So the question is, why does the temporal stem uh, get left behind? Uh, but the bottom line is, if it does get left behind because it's the deepest area, doing a repeat surgery is very straightforward. It takes about 15 to 20 minutes. There is a nice formation of porencephaly by which endoscope, through which endo and the endoscope could be introduced. And we have to go in front of the ventral amygdala to disconnect the temporal stem. And the reason why it could be left behind is because perhaps it's the deepest area. So it's over here. So like Professor Mashoda was showing, showing that the deepest area for lateral approach could be the genu. Whereas for the vertical approach happens to be the temporal stem. And of course, it's around the curve, unless you happen to be an expert like Robert Carlos, who could deliver a curve ball, uh, sometimes it's difficult to access. But the bottom line is, if you leave it, it should not be considered as a failure, especially for complex pathologies like hemimegalencephaly. It can be considered as a staging technique because you could always go back if the seizures are not controlled. And it's very important to understand that presence of a residual stem and its consequent address can lead to uh, a successful outcome once again. So overall, we felt that the endoscopic technique was, uh, we were able to show its proof of concept. We showed that it's safe, effective, minimally invasive. We, did for, we do it for all kinds of pathologies. There is a definite learning curve, but there is an actual excellent visualization and understanding the anatomy, especially the relation of temporal stem can enhance the success further and doing a repeat surgery would be uh, simpler. Sorry. So uh, all this has allowed us uh, to develop the concept of a new technique, which I would be focusing on today, which is the use of thermocoagulation for performing a hemispherotomy. And we thought that the abbreviation of Roch will be nice, nice, which would stand for robotic thermocoagulative hemispherotomy. And author feels that this would generate a lot of discussion and I look forward for this discussion. And incidentally, uh, Roch also stands for a small uh, Arctic seabird, uh, which is common along both coasts of Atlantic, especially in winter. It's also called as little auk. And I thought it gels very well with the nature of the technique and to the age of uh, patients in which this technique is being applied. Now, we also developed the technique of uh, robotic guided thermocoagulative uh, disconnections for hypothalamic hematomas. And we published a paper in this uh, where we would uh, uh, co register it with the OAM. And while dealing with this large hypothalamic hematoma where we required eight trajectories and 34 burns to disconnect this pedicle, that is where I started thinking that could we just move a little bit more laterally and perform a thermocognitive disconnection uh, for hemispherotomy. And that's where I started thinking about this technique. I discussed with my colleagues, my fellows, and we did trial runs on phantoms. And, 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 and we found that it could be feasible. But the question is why change from an already minimally invasive endoscopic hemispherotomy to a, uh, another new technique? So endoscopic hemispherotomy is good 
because it's minimally invasive, excellent visualization, less fevers as compared to open technique, less blood loss, less of hypothermia. But definitely there is a lot of learning curve, especially for epilepsy surgeons who are not conversant with the endoscopic technique. And of course, the issues of access to temporal stem, as I've shown you here, that it is around the curve. So that could be a challenge in some cases. And definitely minimally invasive uh, nature of surgery is a way to go forward for hemispherotomy because it's applied to the pathologies where most of the patients are small kids. And the paper which we published in NAGM clearly showed that surgical therapy is not only seven times better than medical therapy, but the sooner it is done, the better. So we just cannot, if we come across these pathologies in very young kids, we cannot wait for so long as to allow the child to grow up. So how did this idea materialize and why did it materialize? So obviously, you know, we have a robotic system which is capable of performing multiple trajectories. And then we also have the ability to co-register uh, the OAM with the uh, robotic trajectory which allows a very nice and accurate uh, access to the target, which we do it for all, all the cases, but we don't do it for all the trajectories. We do do it at best for one or two tra trajectories for the issues of radiation exposure. And then the radio frequency ablation produces a sphere of five millimeters if burned for 74 to 80 degrees for 60 seconds. And if you overlap the sphere, uh, at every three millimeters with an overlap margin of two millimeters, we would be potentially be able to produce a linear burn, which could provide a complete disconnection. And then we started calculating what could be the possible number of trajectories if you want to do a thermocoagulative hemispherotomy. Now, offhand, if you think it looks as if we are dealing with a huge amount of area, but the truth is that the hemispheric footprint is about one fifth the size of the cortical footprint. And when we calculated the number of trajectories and lesions, we found that approximately we would require seven to 10 trajectories actually, and seven to 14 burns for each trajectory, which seemed quite okay, uh, uh, considering the fact that uh, we were producing many lesions in hypothalamic hematomas. And you can see that the hemispheric footprint is about one fifth the size of the cortical footprint. And then we calculated the kind of trajectories we would have. So obviously we have an anterior disconnection trajectory. Then we have the middle disconnection where we would have seven to 10 trajectories. Then we have the posterior disconnection, which is from the posterior part. And the corpus callosum can be tackled by four trajectories, which go from a paramedian to midline location. So the position, the technique of the uh, procedure is that patient is positioned uh, supine. The head is fixed to Mayfield or Alexil's frame and uh, fixed to the Rosa head support system. And we use anchor bolts as fiducials for having more of accuracy and so that we can also keep the Rosa further away from the patient to allow adequate movement of the robotic arm. And I will briefly show you the surgical technique, which runs for about four minutes. Uh, there is no audio here except when we check the impedance. The first step obviously is that the robotic arm goes to the position. And then we attach the adapter. Now we put adapter flush with the skin. Now initially we would use a number 11 scalpel to make a nick and then put the adapter. But that again causes unnecessary bleeding which is not required. So putting the adapter flush with the skin. Uh, and then passing the twistle directly from the skin into the bone. And we have found that this is absolutely bloodless and we have never had any issues in terms of any wound dehiscence and we need to just put a single stitch. And now we pass the dural uh, coagulator to produce dural coagulation. And now the robot calculates the distance to the target. And then now we pass the electrode, which is passed in small rotatory moments. And now we have three modes of accessing the target. A, of course, is a robotic. B is core registration with the OAM. And third is by listening to the impedance and also looking at the values of impedance on the radio frequency generator. So when we are in the ventricle, the impedance is around 100 ohms and it's of low frequency. And as we reach the parent gamma, which is in the target, the impedance would increase to about 200. And we can also listen to the sound which becomes high frequency sound. 
So we keep on passing it. So the final adjustment can be done based on the impedance. And now you can see that it's a high frequency impedance and the values are at 200 plus which indicates few millimeters. that we are in the parent camera. So my fellow is saying a few millimeters more. So the same thing being shown on the radio frequency generator where you can find the impedance rising from 100 till so the same video what I was showing over there and now it goes more than 200 indicating we are in the parent camera and then we take a shot with the OAM to ensure that it's nicely co-registered with the OAM because this was an atrophic case so we are able to co-register it with the MRI also showing that it actually goes up to the target. And that's the sagittal section where we can show that it goes right up to the target. Now, when we do the disconnection, we first go to the deepest area of the target, start burning it out, and then coming more and more superficial. So now we are burning. So the lesion is produced. Now you can see the markings with the pen. These are at the distance of three millimeters so that we can provide an overlap of two millimeters. And each lesion is about five to eight millimeters in sphere. And then we keep on withdrawing. And once the procedure is over, we withdraw the electrode using the robotic system. So it allows absolutely no movement of the electrode. And once it's withdrawn, we inject glue. And that seals the leak completely so that there is no CSF leak and we just put a single stitch. So you can see it's absolutely bloodless. So we don't have any amount of blood loss here. So we have uh, the following trajectories. One is an anterior disconnection, which is coronal. Then we have a middle disconnection with this uh, parasagittal. Uh, and then we have, uh, now we localize amygdala and temporal stem orthogonally because again, accessing from vertically would be an issue for, and we have separate trajectories for amygdala and as well as for temporal stem. The corpus callosum is covered in four trajectories. And then finally, we do the posterior disconnection, which is a temporal efference at the junction of the temporal horn with the atrium uh, and consists of the tail of the hippocampus and the fornix. So a few examples, this is a 12 year old male child, uh, five to eight episodes per day, seizures per day, left hemiparesis. It's a burnt out Rasmussen's and you can see signal changes bilaterally. But what was ideal for this to be the first case is because there was no corpus callosum or the temporal stem. So all we had to do was a middle disconnection. So we, we kind of targeted the middle disconnection. And now I would like to point out that you can see that these targets are kind of randomly placed. And I'll tell you why this is important. So when we did, the seizure frequency reduced, but he still continued having seizures. And when we did a repeat MRI, we found some skip areas. And we had to go in and do sir, repeat surgery after two weeks, after which he had a class two outcome, which was not bad considering that there was bilateral changes and uh, it was a burnt out Rasmussen. That's a patient post-op. Now, this is a second case, which was a six year old uh, child post head injuries. Again, a nice atrophic case with a middle, but in this case, we also had to target the amygdala and the temporal stem, even though the corpus callosum was completely thinned out. Now you could look at the pattern of the trajectories as compared to the previous one. So we did a total of 101 lesions through 17 trajectories. And here we used a technique called as X technique where through a single hole, we were able to provide three diverging trajectories. And this is a new technique which we developed, which would allow a nice planar disconnection. And this is immediate post-op. And this is a patient seizure free after surgery. And these are the only stitches we had to apply. And using this X technique, we were able to reduce the number of trajectories as well as number of burns. And we were able to provide a nice planar disconnection as shown in this MRI. 
And the reason that why it works is that we need to only disconnect from the floor of the lateral ventricle to the roof of the temporal horn. And over here, the trajectories are more or less parallel, which can produce a nice hemispheric disconnection as shown. This is, of course, not some other patient. Another example of a right a large frontal uh, hemispheric cortical dysplasia where we targeted, we did all the possible disconnections, including the corpus callosum. Uh, call a callosal disconnection and again showing all the trajectories anterior, middle, corpus callosal, posterior, amygdala, temporal stem. And this is a post op uh, CT scan showing a nice hemispheric disconnection. This is the temporal stem, this is the anterior disconnection, there's a middle disconnection, there's a corpus callosal disconnection. Uh, we had 14 trajectories, 98 lesions, and we were able to significantly reduce the number of lesions using the X, te X technique. This is a five month old child who had again a large frontoparietal cortical dysplasia. And again, we went ahead and did hemispheric disconnection using the X technique, and we were able to achieve the complete disconnection. This is immediate post op. And after one week, when we remove the sutures, you can't even make out where the surgery was done. And this is that follow up at six months where the child was completely seizure free. And the parents were quite happy. So uh, this is the preliminary results of six patients uh, uh, where who all of them had class one outcome except for the one Rasmussen's who had a class two outcome. Now in one case, we had a small hematoma in the medial temporal part and this was because we were too close to the mesencephalic cistern. So henceforth, we ensure that we are at least eight millimeters away from the medial margin close to the mesencephalic cistern. Now this patient had a ptosis which is recovering uh, but otherwise had a class one outcome. And uh, these are the number of trajectories and lesions we produced. I'm sorry for the uh, uh, cluttered slide, but the mean number of trajectories were around 15 plus or minus 2.5 and mean number of lesions were 108 plus or minus 25. The largest number of disconnections are obviously required for middle disconnections. Now duration definitely is an issue. The mean duration was 10 hours plus or minus three hours, ranging from five hours to 14 hours. But the best part is even after such a long duration of surgery, the patient wakes up on the table and the post of course is absolutely beautiful. You know, he just can be discharged within a couple of days. So doing a SWOT analysis, I think the strengths of this procedure is that it's, it's the preliminary results to show that the proof of concept, it's feasible. The results, initial results are promising, seems to be safe. I think it's the most minimally invasive procedure ever for the maximally invasive pathology. There is absolutely no blood loss and this itself on a long term may reduce incidence of hydrocephalus, especially for complex pathologies like hemimeg or cortical dysplasias. There is no fever. 50% of our endoscopic surgeries, even endoscopic surgeries had fever going on because there would be some blood entering the ventricle and then it would subside by five or six days. But in this technique, absolutely no fever and patient opens up the eyes, absolutely crystal clear, starts talking and it's very satisfying. Uh, when you see the patient next day, there is a rapid learning curve, unlike the endoscopic technique. So you do four or five lesioning and then it's the same repetitive and your fellows would do the rest of the surgery. Now, by introducing modifications like the X techniques, we would reduce the number of trajectories and the lesions, of course, could be repeated. Now, weaknesses, obviously, is the number of durations, the duration of surgery, risk of skip lesions, it could be reduced by X technique. And of course, the potential for a robotic malfunction in midway, thankful it's not happened, but if it happens, you may have to you know, restart the robotic devices. But definitely it provides an immense opportunities because I believe it's start of a technology, it's start of a new procedure. So it gives plenty of opportunity for the technology to catch up in terms of devising automated robotic systems, bloodless disconnections, multi-point uh, RF electrodes. The threat is, of course, a blind procedure and there could be a hematoma as seen in one of our cases, but thermocoagulation is a very safe procedure. If you look at the literature, there are literally thousands of cases being done. And if one takes care of the trajectory and burns, it's, it's quite safe. This is just to show the temperature chart between the endoscopic procedure above and the endoscopic, uh, uh, the thermocoagulative procedure, I'm sorry, above and the endoscopic procedure below. So you can see absolutely no fever from day zero onwards, wherein in endoscopic, you know, most of the cases we have the spikes of fever because of the blood going into ventricle and then it settles down by day six or seven. 
think the best part of this technique when you finish it it's it's quite a long procedure because we have to do so many of burns but when we finish it there is no closure few stitches absolutely no blood loss so summarizing thermo a robotic thermocoagulate hemispherotomy abbreviated as roch seems to be safe effective feasible and for me personally a journey of 18 years into this pathology gives me an immense satisfaction i used to dream that perhaps one day we'll be able to do hemispheric disconnection without any blood loss and this seems to be some kind of achievement towards that dream that we started off with something like this and finally we are going towards it it's the most minimally invasive blood loss it's accepted for publication journal of neurosurgery pediatrics and i think it's gentle on the pathology on the age group on which we are going to apply it so before i close my talk i would like to acknowledge all my colleagues especially my colleague dr ramesh my fellows shabri raghu and mohit who have been the backbone of doing this surgical procedure and of course the entire team starting with uh, manjuri my wife and we also have a research faculty for senda we also have a mex center it's only one of its kind of center i think for the whole uh, country and for the whole south asia and summarizing i think it's all about change if you have read this book who moved my cheese the cheese stands for a metaphor for change and there are various types of insights that this mice get while going through the journey so smell the cheese often so that you know when it's getting old so we should look at when the procedure is getting old and we should be ready to switch over uh, adapt to changes quickly the quicker you let go of old cheese the sooner you can enjoy the new cheese meaning that if you get a newer procedure the sooner you shift to a newer procedure the more you can enjoy it but this is the best the best is that if you want to devise a new technique i think sit back and think of what you would like to do if you weren't afraid and then i'm sure you would come up with the uh, most important solution so thank you thank you very much thank you so much uh, sarat for this exciting uh, presentation i think we are now ready to to start our discussions uh, we have actually lots of questions around and uh, from a very widespread uh, uh, attendance from all over the world um I just uh, i i see i i see that we have uh, some people that might contribute uh, to this panel and i would just uh, start by i see uh, george dov miller he's going to be with us for the hypothalamic uh, thing and i would like to bring him to the panel and uh, as as you mentioned james baumgarten uh, and i think i saw him around i hope he's still around but if so james if you don't mind uh, to to join us uh, and then let's start uh, let's start with the questions uh, so initially to to elio um just a bit so the first one would be uh, to elio is uh, we it it appears that it's simple when you have a nice ventricle to navigate uh, but what happened in those kids with meg me meg that do not have a ventricle system uh, in any lobe to for you to navigate how how would you do your procedure yes it's a very nice uh, very good question thank you uh, it's very important uh, uh, this uh, point uh, as i said uh, uh, in many cases the ventricle are small and, and worse than that they are deformed sometimes multiloculated this is very difficult uh, uh, you have uh, you, you have to rely on the, on uh, uh, the neural navigation and uh, in the, in your experience uh, to try to stay uh, exactly to find the 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 place where you want as I, i show as i mentioned before surgery we try to plan uh, accurately the more accurately as possible because uh, as i showed uh, uh, from the ventricle you have to do the the callosotomy and uh, you have to 
to the splenium, to, to section the splenium, the corpus callosum, all things that um, are not very easy, as I mentioned. But that's right. It's very difficult when you have the small, deformed, multiloculated ventricles. Yeah, the other question refers to age, uh, uh, to technique. Uh, do you prefer periinsular hemispherotomy in all cases or just in MMAG cases? Now, I prefer to do uh, uh, the lateral approach the, uh, in all the cases, although uh, I know very well the, the, the work of my, my good friend, George Dolph Miller, and uh, his antecessor, George uh, uh, de la Lande, Olivier de la Lande, that we met a long time ago in France. Uh, I know very well his, their technique, and I prefer to do the lateral approach because I'm more comfortable, uh, except in cases that you have dilated ventricles, unilateral, the, the, the ventricle is dilated, the lateral ventricle is dilated and make the surgery, the, 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 the superior approach easier. Uh, these are some, the, in my experience, the minority of the cases. So in all hemispherectomies that I perform, almost all, I prefer the lateral approach. George, would you like to join this the discussion at this point? Would you like to mention something? Yes, I, I uh, just wanted to, I noticed that, uh, Helio, you said um, that in cases of hemimegalencephaly, where your epileptologist said, there's one single focus or less than hemispheric focus, why not go for a less surgery? And you said uh, that in most cases, these children uh, re scissor again. Indeed, there are, you know, pathologies like hemimegalencephalies, where the megalencephaly is not the entire hemisphere. You can have sometimes the frontal cortex quite nicely, and the, and the, and the hemimegalencephaly starts behind. So in these cases, you, try, you can try to do a less than hemispherotomy for these seemingly hemimegalencephaly cases, and we have some very good results. Um, concerning uh, uh, the, the, the problem with ischemia, and uh, um, of course, uh, everybody has, I, I, I thank you for your honest and very thorough uh, presentation. Everybody tries to sell his own technique, and uh, of course we, with our vertical technique, uh, we avoid conflicts with any vessels. We do our cortical window, subcortical window, and even in hemimegalencephaly cases, we, we, we don't have to confront with large draining vessels who, which, which could later, or identification of arteries which could later uh, need edema, and you mentioned temporal, temporal resection. So I think what we do, we do subpiously uh, uh, from, the, from the ventricles on, and then we put systematically in hemimegalencephaly. Indeed, we have over 30, about 25 to 30 percent shunt rate in these cases, and we do systematically a, a ventricular drainage for a few days on postoperative on ICU, which usually avoids the problematic of edema, and we don't see strong edema on postoperative controls. Sarah, would you like to, to join? Yes. Uh, so I, I agree with George. You know, initially I would do the lateral approach uh, for hemimegalencephalis, and then I slowly converted to vertical. The reason is that in one of the patients, I did have an issue that patient had a large hemimegalencephaly, and the window of disconnection I made was too small, and there was some injury to the vein because of which the patient had brain swelling, and we had to do a uh, decompressive craniotomy. And uh, that's when I switched over completely to the vertical technique because there's absolutely no vascular conflict. And surprisingly, I find that when I use the endoscope uh, for the vertical technique and when I kind of disconnect, there is not too much of bleeding in the inner surface. Most of the, I, I, I don't know how the other people would agree from it. This is my perception. Perhaps I could be wrong. But over the uh, 13 or 14 or 15 cases of hemimeg, what I've done, I find that whenever I have done the endoscopic technique, uh, the bleeding definitely is much less when I'm doing the internal disconnection rather than going from the surface. James, uh, we are talking about the endoscope. Uh, you're itching to join or? Uh, I'm just, I'm just um, uh, impressed with the progress that Surat continues to make on, on the technical approaches to hemispherotomy. Uh, hemispherotomy. 
I haven't um, had the courage yet, but I think um, based on this presentation, I'm going to try. I just wondered, has anybody uh, attempted to, to do any kind of disconnections beyond the callosotomy with the laser uh, as an alternate? And I'm not sure. Do, do we in the panel have any experience with laser ablation uh, for doing so? Yeah. Oh, so, I this, this is Jorge. Where are you? Jorge? I, Where are I'm you? I'm doing well. Oh, yeah, but we don't see you. Are you Sorry. are you looking so ugly today that you are not showing up? Nope. Or okay, no, I'm here <laughs> on the road. So yeah, so um, we attempted to do a couple uh, disconnections uh, with uh, the laser. The problem is the proximity with the ventricular system. Uh, it's difficult to, uh, with the laser ablations, to really heat up and uh, reach a permanent lesion because of the shunt effect of the CSF in the laser. So it's, to me, was a technique that I abandoned just because I was much more efficient to perform a complete disconnection by conventional surgery than by the laser, by the difficulties in heating the tissue because of the shunt effect of the CSF. Yeah, great. Before moving to another issue, we have, I have a point question here uh, to, to Elio. Uh, would you please state the, your minimum wage and weight for considering any, uh, this type of procedures? Well, uh, uh, typically the, it's considered that uh, you can do surgery after three months of age, uh, about six kilos. But uh, we have some cases that we did it before that, when uh, uh, around two months of age. The, the problem is that they are, these are special children uh, with uh, uh, many, many, many seizures and they, they're going really down uh, progressively from the neurological point of view. So we uh, decided to do surgery very early. And, uh, you can do that the, the, uh, uh, in, child, in children with uh, less than two months of age, or uh, less than three months of age, the typical age. Uh, I mean, uh, around two months of age. Thank you. I, I see that Matthew has a written uh, question, but uh, I see now we have him in the panel. So, Matthew, why don't you speak up your question instead of me reading it? Can you hear me? Yeah, I had a question for Dr. Chandra. You showed a five-month-old that was uh, fixated to Rosa. How did you do the head fixation for that case? And I also had a comment about laser ablation, if we want to circle back to it. Yeah, so uh, for the five-month-old, we used a pediatric Mayfield, and we also gave a support from below using a, a headrest. So the partial support was from the, head, uh, from the headrest below as well as from the pediatric Mayfield clamp. But definitely it's a challenge, you know, if you have younger kids. Uh, I was thinking maybe I could fix them very nicely on some kind of a head support with plasters, but again, there would be an issue of uh, accuracy. So yes, that was the youngest child we did, five months, and that's what we did in that child. So Jorge, you mentioned some concern about laser ablation and hemispherotomy because of the heat sink of the ventricle. Um, I, I've used it on a handful of cases where there was a residual splenial connection or frontal basal disconnection that wasn't complete with an open surgery. And using a laser with just one or two uh, trajectories has, has worked pretty well for, for those sort of cleanup cases. One issue with RF thermocoagulation, at least in the States, would be getting insurance approvals to do these procedures. Um, and it's not FDA approved, so it'd be difficult to do those um, here in the States. So, so I just want to make a comment, make a comment on ages, uh, Jim Baumgartner again. We had a child that was born in um, really difficult status epilepticus, which we could not control. And we ended up operating at about seven days of age. It took three trips to get it done, but that kid got a class two outcome. So I think um, it's technically challenging, but if you have a child in extremis, you can really go uh, young if you have to. I believe, Arthur, it's Guy, I believe there's a, uh, another question from, from uh, Dr. Sada Shiva, uh, which is, about for the radio frequency technique, is a complete callosotomy possible with this technique? And could you further explain the details of the X technique for Sarah? 
So am I allowed to show the slide if I were to explain it properly? Yeah, and the other question was if there's no atrophy, how, are, how long does it take in that case? And yeah, absolutely share if you would like. Yeah, so I'll, I'll just share my screen so that I'm able to show uh, the slide. This was a patient where we did the X technique for the first time. And over here, you can see that we have a single twist drill opening. Now the question is, how can we put multiple trajectories through a single twist drill? Because the principle of twist drill is that it can only pass the trajectory in only one direction. So what we do is we have this robotic adapter which goes flush with the screen, uh, with the skin, and we first pass the middle trajectory. And then we change it to one side, and then we do the twist drilling again. So it kind of refashions the already made twist drill so that we are now able to pass the second trajectory exactly through the same twist drill which has been refashioned. Uh, and it kind of passes in a slightly divergent manner so that we are able to produce the planar disconnection. And then we go back and again produce a third trajectory again through the same twist drill. So the advantage is at the end you need to put only a single stitch. You don't end up because otherwise you would think that with so many trajectories, the whole head would be a mess. You would have a bundle of stitches or sutures on the head again, which is not good cosmetically and again may cause to some problems like wound hazens and all that. So using this X technique through the same twist drill by refashioning it, we are able to pass three trajectories. And this is how it is. So this is the kind of chart we have. So we have the various trajectories written on the left side. And then we write uh, with the hand. So there is a separate fellow who's sitting there who records the temperature as well as the impedance. So like I've told you, the fine, fine tuning is done by the radio frequency generated impedance. So if we go right up to the uh, parent camera, the impedance goes up to 200. And sometimes we may not have an increase of temperature up to 70 degrees, like for instance here. That could happen if the burn areas are too close to each other. And that is when the temperature may not go up so high. So in this case, it was surrounded by a burn area of 70 on one side and 82 on the other side. So sometimes it's possible that the temperature over here may not rise further because the tissues are already completely burnt there. And using the X technique, we were able to bring down the number of skin sutures. And again, this is how the X technique looks like. So a single uh, twist drill, three diverging trajectories, and that's why we call this as X technique. Now, <laughs> Okay, so just let, we have another, uh, not some other uh, technical questions. If you could then share, so we could see each other. Perfect. So would you comment uh, on incomplete disconnection to, to Sarah? Uh, could you comment on incomplete disconnection and vascular injury using the technique, like the pericalosal artery? Uh, we are nowhere near uh, the pericalosal artery. The reason is that when we are doing the corpus callosal technique we are going in a paramedial location and entering through the diverging fibers of the corpus callosum and not exactly in the midline, we are going through the parenchyma under the corpus callosum. So we are nowhere near the artery actually. So that way, and these trajectories are oblique. So we have four trajectories. So there's also a question, can we do a complete corpus callosotomy? So the first trajectory goes anteriorly and in an oblique direction and it goes through the posterior 50% of the corpus callosum. So it starts on one side of the corpus callosum and kind of goes till it's on the other side. So it kind of covers the entire width. So we first lesion the deepest area of corpus callosum and then start withdrawing it by every three millimeters. Then we have a posterior trajectory which covers the anterior 50% of the corpus callosum. And then we have a separate trajectory for the genu as well as splenium because they're at an angle to the corpus callosum and it's not possible to cover with uh, the earlier two trajectories. So with four trajectories, you are able to cover the entire corpus callosum. And most often in atrophic cases, you know, the corpus callosum may not be present or could be present only in the posterior part or in the splenial part. Now coming to the question of uh, incomplete uh, lesioning, definitely that's a challenge. I think the incidence has reduced quite a lot after we have started doing X technique. And the fact is that even though it's diverging at the level of the twist drill, but when it comes down by about three or four centimeters, that is where we need to start the disconnection. The trajectories are more or less parallel to each other. And the amount of disconnection which we need to cover is just about three or four centimeters, during which using this technique, we are able to 
do a complete planar disconnection. But yes, definitely there is a chance that there could be an incomplete disconnection. But if it is there, only long term results will show. Uh, I'm sure it's very easy to go back and do a second lesioning again. It would be minimally invasive. The other technical issue is uh, do you use any intraoperative uh, monitoring like intraoperative MRI or else? No, no. We don't use because uh, first of all, these electrodes are not MRI compatible. So the kind of guidance we have is threefold. First is the robotic trajectory. The second is we use the OAM core registration. And the final guidance, guidance is by the impedance feedback from the radio frequency generator, which ensures that we get it to the yeah. And one do has you, to understand. Do, do you do these procedures in both adults and kids or just kids? Uh, so far in the preliminary results, the oldest patient we had was 12 years old. So technically we could do it much more easily in adults because of less vascular issues and all that. But yes, it could be done in anybody. The other question is, uh, I, I believe this is very early experience. You don't have a very long term uh, outcome, but uh, you have any information on uh, uh, developmental or, or cognitive outcome in these kids? We have done secondary uh, outcome assessment at the end of one year and they were comparable with the endoscopic technique, which means that the development is going on. And one of the issues is obviously that can this increase the temperature while we are doing thermocore? We are producing 100 lesions. Does it increase the temperature? So we have to understand that when we are doing an open technique, the temperatures produced by bipolars is much more than what is being produced by the thermocoagulation. So uh, our initial experience has been very, very satisfying. So the best part is the moment the procedure is over, next day, we have electrically ventilated because that's what we did for our, we do for our endoscopic surgeries and because it's a long procedure. But next day morning, you know, the child opens his eyes, her eyes, and is absolutely fine, and we could wean off. And next two, three days, actually, the child is fit for discharge because all we have done is just multiple births. Well, let's, so, uh, let, let, let's, see, let's get a situation uh, where we have the best of, of anything in our, is, our, is available to us. Uh, that we have radio frequency ablations and etc. all over the world and laser ablation and etc. Uh, how to, to all of you in the panel, how would you choose for each technique? I think it seems attractive and logical that uh, Sarat started in the very atrophic cases. We saw the images of large hamartomas and in the atrophic cases at the, the brain uh, at the basal areas, you have the same surface. In cases of uh, huge and, uh, and hemimegalencephaly, or you had one dysplasia, cortical hemispheric dysplasia case. Um, I wonder if, did you do early postoperative imaging to see if there is brain edema, space occupying brain edema in cases where you go through a longer, longer section line? Yes, that's a good question. So we have done CT scans twice in these patients. So we do it immediate post-op after the surgery is over on the same day to ensure there is no hematoma. And we repeated the plain CT scan after four or five days. That's where we would expect the maximum edema to be there. And on plain CT scan, we didn't find any change. We find this beautiful black disconnection. But yes, when we did the MRI on flare sequences, there seems to be a much wider area indicating a larger area of involvement because of thermocoagulation. But the same thing is not seen on T1 weighted sequences, which actually is comforting for us because if the lesion is very large on flare sequences, that gives us some kind of confidence <clears throat> that even though the lesions are not end to end and there is some gap in between. So perhaps this gap would be taken care by this damage, which is happening because of the spread of the heat. But would there so, sit, is, okay. would, yeah, go ahead. So Arthur, uh, you mentioned about uh, how I use uh, different techniques uh, and you asked that question. I think it's important uh, to just to emphasize, uh, you know, we have all those, what we call less invasive techniques like laser thermocoagulation, but this is a difficult disease. Uh, this is a disease that frequently comes with a recurrence and uh, typically comes with incomplete disconnection. This is not a trivial procedure. So I just want to raise uh, the, the point that, uh, you know, long-term serious outcomes are necessary, first of all, to really understand 
what is the role of those less invasive or non-traditional methods for hemimegalencephaly and for hemispheric epilepsy. That's my, my comment. What will be the impact on your practice of what you're saying? I think if I have uh, areas that need to be complete disconnection, uh, to be com the disconnection needs to be completed, and it's a small tissue, it's a small area, for example, dysplenium, perhaps we could uh, attempt a laser or a thermocoagulation. I think uh, Shirach shows very clearly the feasibility of that approach. But if this is a large disconnection uh, areas like amimegalo or highly complex cases, I would still attempt to do the conventional disconnection versus the hemispheric. Arthur, can I add a comment there? Yeah, sure, please go ahead. Yeah, I just I, I think between last session and this session, we've seen multiple really different anatomically expert ways to carry out very, very difficult surgeries, as Jorge says. And for instance, Helio today showed us his beautiful experience doing a procedure in a pathology that maybe a lot of people with less experience would have a greater frequency of incomplete disconnection if they tried his approach right away. And similarly, Sarad is, is, has learned from his endoscopic technique the anatomy of the disconnections of his radiofrequency technique. And I think, as people said last week, one of the most important things is that every individual has to do what is safe in their hands to try to achieve the, the maximal outcome for the patient safely. And that includes how do you incorporate? So if I wanted to incorporate, for instance, Sarat's technique, presuming, as Matt said, that I could get it approved in the US, the first thing that I would do is I would send him an email and I would say, can we go over your plans so that I can benefit from your learning in a way that it's hard to do just from reading a paper. And I think for all of us, we have to be doing learning and constantly improving our techniques without compromising our results and minimizing our learning curve. So that was just my comment. Arthur, may I put a comment? Yes, please go ahead, Bertha. Yeah, uh, I, I can only say that both these uh, lecturers have given great, great, great descriptions of very difficult techniques. And especially the Sarat's uh, thermocoagulation is it's very difficult. And I can only agree with you guys that it's extremely important to continue to do what you are most confident with at the same time as you have your eyes wide open for new techniques. To both uh, uh, Sandra and Helio, I just congratulate you to, to your very, very great lectures. Uh, and I would like to learn them, both of them. But I'm going to continue with my techniques for, for some time before I learn the new techniques. Thank you. Uh. Just before you, you, you go ahead, sir, it's, it's just appeared that, uh, you know, neurosurgery has history and what it, maybe what we are seeing, uh, is it, would, would it be fair to say that we are, start, we started with resections and then went to major resection and then major disconnection and then the endoscope and then uh, uh, radio frequency or laser ablation things. Is this a kind of evolution or is just technique change or preference? What do you think? You might think something. <laughs> now, uh, Arthur, is that question for me? For everybody in the panel. So, uh, I, will, I will leave the other panel because uh, Hello. Yes, I can hear you. I think there is. It, it's working. Go ahead. Can you hear me? Yeah, uh, I, I, I'll leave it to other panelists. So, yeah, so I will leave it to the other panelists to answer this question. I, I will ask, I would like to comment on a very nice comment made by one of my good friends. Uh, he asked a question that should one keep learning new techniques and keep updating all the time? So my answer is more of a philosophical perspective. So the question is, are we not doing that in life as always? So we, we start as a young kid, we go for college, 
we uh, you know go through all the cycles of life we get married we have children so at every stage there's a change coming up so i think the most important thing is to embrace the change and see how it kind of fits into your uh, paradigm properly or may i put a comment doctor sure, go ahead i totally agree with you sarah you should always continue learning things but you should also be confident that when you finally do it, you are fully learned. But I completely agree with you and you have an extremely elegant technique. Thank you. Now, Arthur, can I make a comment also? Yes, please go ahead. Nick. Yeah, I think in, in relation to your question about is this just evolution or is it a real change? I, I think it is a real change time. I think that robotics and imaging are allowing people like Surat to try ideas that never could have been tried before. And the radio frequency techniques, the robotics, the laser, all of them are completely infantile right now. And so when you think back to when people first started coiling aneurysms, and you looked at it and you said, okay, it may take a while, but this just makes sense. And you know, I know it's gonna take the field, a long time as well as technological experts and, and uh, corporate people working in this area. But I do think that minimally invasive is not just going to be a fad. I do think it's a historical shift point. Matthew, Matthew you are very silent today. Uh, would you jump on? Yeah, I agree with Di. I think we've come a long way with laser just in a few years. And um, also, I think, you know, in contradistinction to Jorge's comment about the CSF spaces being a problem, actually, I see the cisterns and spaces being helpful in delineating the, the margins of ablation. So you can use laser, I think, to achieve a lot of disconnection respecting those um, CSF spaces because your ablation goes to that spot and then stops. James, are you there? We cannot see it by our there. Arthur, do you hear uh, me? Yes, yes, go ahead. I just wanted to, to say that uh, uh, these are long learning curves and uh, it's, it's fantastic what we saw today and we will follow it. And I, but I agree on the other side with what Jorge said before that uh, in the beginning, it's, I think it's normal to be reluctant to wait, await long-term results. Uh, we are speaking about techniques which we learned over over 10 to 15 years learning curve to achieve a, a very good level. So I think I agree that I will continue doing hemistrotomy in the classical sense and start perhaps doing stereotactically thermocoagulations in, in residual tissue for second look surgery. And if this is successful, and, uh, then, then we might switch in the future. But I think it is normal that people who learned that technique for many, many years will continue. But this was in the past the same case when people did anatomical hemispherectomies and then functional hemispherectomies and were in the beginning reluctant to the new hemispherotomy techniques. So this is, this is evolution. Elio, would you like to give us your opinion on this? Yeah, I, I, I think it's, a, it's very important to, to know uh, new techniques. But there's a, uh, as a pediatric neurosurgeon, there's one question that, one thing that you must not forget. We're dealing with the children with, uh, uh, and with the, the, the parents, the mother, uh, mainly the mother. And it's very difficult to say to a mother, I will operate on your child. And uh, she says, uh, which technique are you going to? Oh, I just learned, uh, uh, I want to try a new technique. Uh, <laughs> With the robot and uh, everything that work in, uh, in uh, with Sarah, the, uh, I'm sure that she will, she, she will say no. Well, why don't you do what, what you have done for 20 years, 30, 30 years, and it's done in, it's, uh, doing right. So, uh, from one side, uh, we must follow all the new techniques. I'm not against. Uh, we are starting with the uh, robots and radio frequency we have for a long time, laser not yet, but I think uh, it's uh, valid and uh, you have to do, but uh, with much, much caution. 
And the second thing is uh, you need long term to, uh, to see what you're doing is right or not. You, you, you need a follow up, a long term follow up. And this uh, you, you will not have until you have done the same technique for at least five years and uh, following all your uh, children, all your patients operate on. That's uh, what I think, but I'm not against. I have a comment also. Oh, yes, please, Berto. And then after, after Berto, maybe we would like to hear Christian. Yeah. yeah. I, I just completely agree with you, Helio. That was a great comment because one of the most common questions you get and doctor or whatever you, they say, how many exactly similar cases have you done with exactly the same techniques? So this is a problem, but I'm certainly not against new techniques, but you, you get difficult to sometimes when you say, okay, I've done hundreds of that or that or 50 of that, that but now I'm going to test a new technique. So there is a problem, of course there is. Thank you. Uh, 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 Christian, would you share your thoughts? Yeah, so I think the main challenge for the future might be that new techniques are coming faster than we can learn each technique. So I think in the future, the main challenge would be what techniques uh, to use for which indication rather than uh, to use, uh, you know, all of them. Because I guess for the next couple of years, there will be new techniques arising. So focused ultrasound is just on the horizon. So I think this is one of the main challenges uh, because these techniques are faster than we can learn them. Oh, I think you're, you're, you're perfectly right. Uh, the, 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 we need long-term data is, uh, is valid for, for everything. You know? it, it was valid for temporal lobectomy uh, five, five decades ago. It's valid for laser ablation today. It's the same issue, so we, we, of course we need it. It's just talking about uh, eventually developing things uh, uh, or not. Uh, do we in the panel have anything we'd like to share before we close? Because it's 12, uh, it's, uh, it's past 28 minutes, so we have two minutes to close. Just to congratulate you all, because these uh, panels are exceptional. It's uh, very excellent, uh, and you must uh, keep going that, just uh, even after this uh, pandemic. Congratulations for you all. Thank you. Guy Berto and Christian. No, I just want to thank both Helio and Surat for two really beautiful and thought-provoking lectures and, and everyone else for the great commentary because I think as we all know, we're all learning from this from each other in a way we never could before and it's, it's, it's a great thing for all of us. I, 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 th I think I, this is, uh, sorry. Go ahead, uh, Berto. No, I just would say this is a great, great, great series of uh, uh, discussions and it's so great to be able to walk, talk with any, anyone uh, throughout the world and you can share your thoughts and whatever in a very, very unconventional uh, way. So, and I would like to thank both Sarat and Helio for great lectures and this is really, really impressive. Thank you. Thank you. I just, I just want to thank, uh, congratulate Elio and Sarah. I learned a lot today. Thank you so much. Thank you. Excellent talk. Thank you. Uh, well, may, may, I have, may I be repetitive and thank you uh, both the lecturers for the excellent lectures and for the exciting discussion. I think we learned a lot today. Uh, we hope to have you all around for our next webinar on hypothalamic hamartomas and to the next, next one will be on tuberous sclerosis. So lots of fun uh, in, in the future and hope to see you there. Bye-bye.